Okay, so good evening everyone. Today we will continue continue with our second part on the chest x-ray and what to look for. Last time we talked, uh, we were talking about the causes of lung collapse and we said there are mainly two types of lung collapse. They are the active and the passive. The active and the passive and there's a third type that is less... Uh, common or let's uh, pronounced uh, that is the fibrotic change a cicatricial lung collapse which is due to fibrosis involving the uh, the air uh, the interstitial part of the lung involved by an abnormality causing loss of volume while the airways themselves and the alveoli the air spaces are uh, normally aerated are intact so you can see the lung is aerated however there is diffuse reticulonodular pattern bilaterally involved both, both lungs causing some loss of volume that is diffuse it's not in one lobe not in one area it is diffuse uh, interstitial reticular pattern which is interstitial fibrosis causing loss loss of volume okay now Regarding the diffuse lung diseases, as we said, diffuse lung disease, the word diffuse is the key. It is bilateral, it is not localized to any anatomical component, it is not in a lobe, not in a segment, it usually involves both lungs, multiple areas, okay? And uh, it, it is most of the times due to interstitial pattern, interstitial abnormality, interstitial disease. There is something that is causing the interstitium of the lung, the tissues between the alveoli, between the bronchi, between the bronchioles, the tissues that support them are abnormal, are fibrotic, are involved in a disease process. Okay, and this will present in multiple patterns like linear, septal lines, miliary shadows, reticulonodular or nodular pattern, honeycombing or honeycomb shadowing, cystic pattern, and peribronchial coughing. Okay, so, regarding the reticular and linear shadowing, uh, you can see in this chest x-ray, it appears reticular, the word, the word reticulum means net, shabaka. So, when you have a reticular pattern or linear pattern, you will see a network, okay, of uh, lines connected with each other in both lungs in multiple lung zones all over bilaterally most of the times not always most of the times it's bilateral resulting in what's called reticular or linear shadowing okay as you can see in this chest x-ray there is a, 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 an irregular network of linear opacities all over bilaterally it sort of dirty chest you look it's not clear lungs it's dirty lungs okay however the lung is aerated there is no air space disease the air is normally inside both lungs but the interstitium is abnormal okay now again for the reticular and linear shadowing we have two types of the reticular pattern it's either fine reticular pattern or coarse reticular pattern depending on the size the width of the uh, lines of the interstitial pattern either fine reticular pattern like here you can see it is dirty chest okay multiple irregular very fine lines bilaterally or it can be coarse like here it's more pronounced more uh, coarse okay So, most of the times, you don't have pure reticular pattern. Most of the times, you have reticulonodular pattern, reticulonodular shadowing. And what does that mean? The reticular pattern, the net -like, network-like uh, uh, lines, are mixed with, an, with nodules, okay? The nodules are less than one centimeter in diameter and they are ill-defined with irregular outlines. If you can see, there is a reticular pattern here. This is a dirty chest. This is bilaterally reticular pattern, diffuse, scattered all over both lungs. 
and if you look carefully you can see some nodules like here and here and here and here and here this is a reticulo nodular pattern and this is the common more common than pure reticular or pure nodular okay if uh, any questions till now anything that is not well understood okay good so what are the causes of diffuse bilateral reticulonodular shadowing? As, re as residents, I expect you to memorize these because they are important and they are common and we see them like an everyday practice. Uh, the causes include infections like fungal viruses, mycoplasma, etc. Uh, pneumoconiosis, more com uh, like cold worker pneumoconiosis, also in silicosis and asbestosis. And here, the occupational history is important. Uh, collagen vascular diseases like SLE, dermatomyositis, scleroderma, rheumatoid lung. Cardiac causes include pulmonary edema and hemosiderosis. This is another, uh, it's uncommon cause of reticular nodular pattern. And there are some miscellaneous causes like idiopathic interstitial fibrosis, extrinsic allergic alveolitis, drugs, sarcoidosis, amyloidosis, alveolar proteinosis, lymphatitis, carcinomatosis. Each one of these uh, multiple causes of reticular and reticular nodular pattern have its own uh, findings, its own distribution. It's, some of them are upper uh, merely, uh, upper lung zones, some of them involve the lower lung zones, some of them are central, some of them are peripheral, some needs occupational history, some there uh, are associated with lymph nodes, some associated with, for example, treatment. Uh, everyone has, it's not reticular nodular shadowing and that's it. No, there are multiple other findings that we need to know uh, in order to uh, this uh, narrow our differential diagnosis okay so you just see a reticular nodular pattern and we write all this differential this is totally wrong we need to see everything in order to narrow our differential diagnosis to the least possible and we need to know every the radiological appearances of every one of them or at least the common ones okay now Regarding honeycomb shadowing, honeycomb is the, you know, the house of the bees, it's honeycomb, okay? Sometimes we see the same appearance in the chest x-ray, and it is caused by air-containing spaces with thick walls that are lined with the bronchiolar epithelium. So it is lined with the bronchiolar epithelium and fibrous tissue, okay? There are bronchioles that are dilated so they contains air okay and it's okay why they are why, why do these bronchioles get dilated due to the destruction of the alveoli surrounding them the alveoli that surrounds the bronchioles are destructed for whatever reason whatever cause and cause the bronchioles to dilate okay and usual almost always it is associated with pulmonary fibrosis most of the, these spaces are 5 to 10 millimeter in size, so they are called honeycombing. For example, you can see in this magnified view of this chest x-ray, first of all, the chest x-ray is obviously uh, abnormal. It is dirty chest, bilaterally diffuse interstitial pattern. And if you look at the lower, right lower lung zone, okay, you can, uh, in the magnified view, you can see these spaces here 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 just like the uh, honeycomb of the bees multiple small spaces that are lined with the bronchiolar epithelium histologically these are the dilated bronchioles of that causes the honeycomb shadowing so when we see honeycomb shadowing we know what are we talking about now what about the linear and the band shadows sometimes we see linear shadows in the chest x-ray what does that mean first of all the term linear is slightly different from the term band shadows linear shadows are less than five millimeter in width less than five millimeter 
while bands usually thicker, more than 5 mm. There are normal structures in the chest, in the lungs that are cause uh, that causes linear or band shadows, like for example blood vessels, the fissures form linear shadows within the lung fields, and there are disease processes that may result in linear shadows. For, uh, that, like we will talk about them in a while, in a moment. Okay. For example, you can see here there is a line. This are these are linear shadows here and here and here. All of these are linear shadows. So what are the causes of the linear and band shadows? The causes, the pathological causes. There are normal st structures that may cause linear shadows, like the, lung, the blood vessels, as we said. The pathological causes include pulmonary infarct, what's called sentinel lines, we will talk about them in a moment, thickened fissures, pulmonary and pleural scars, curvilinear shadows of bully and nematoceles, and plated lactases, what's called Fleischner lines. Okay. So, first of all, what is the sentinel lines? What do they mean? Sentinel lines are mucus-filled bronchi. They are bronchi that are filled with the mucus. So, there is no air inside them. There is a mucus or water density or soft tissue density, whatever you want. They are of the same density on the, on the X-ray. On the CT scan is different, but on this X-ray, they are of the same density. So, they, are, they appear as coarse line lying peripherally, like you look here, these lines here. Coarse line, they are peripherally in contact with the pleura and they curve upward. Okay? They reach the pleura and they curve upward and most commonly they are left-sided and associated with left lower lobe collapse. Okay? They may develop due to kinking of the bronchi adjacent to the collapse. So, they are secondary to the collapse. First, the collapse happens and then the sentinel lines occur because the bronchi or bronchioles will get kinked, will get bent, and this will impede or prevent the drainage of the mucus from these bronchioles and bronchi uh, normally and result in what appears as sentinel lines. As you see here, this is a bronchogram. There is a contrast material within the bronchi, and you can see these lines here curved peripherally towards the pleura, okay? Now, let's talk a little bit about curly lines. Curly lines are, uh, they are of three types. The most famous one are the curly B lines, but there are curly A, curly B, and curly C. And we will uh, show them all in one x-ray uh, just in a minute. First of all, Let's know a little bit about curly A, curly B, and curly C. What do they mean? Curly A lines, they are linear opacities extending from the periphery to the hilum, from the peripheral aspect of the chest, of the lungs, to the hilum. They, are, they happen or occur or seen due to the distension of anastomotic channels between the peripheral lymphatics and the central lymphatics. In the lung, you know there is a lymphatic system that is peripheral and central. If there is any obstruction to this lymphatic drainage, these lines will appear due to the distension of the lymphatics. Regarding curly B lines, they are short horizontal lines situated perpendicularly. Important thing is perpendicular, not parallel, perpendicular to the pleural surface at the lung base. Okay? Almost always we see them at the lung base. Rarely we see them elsewhere. And, and it is due to the edema of the interlobular septa. Okay? Regarding curly C lines, they are reticular opacities at the lung base representing superimposed curly B lines. So curly C is basically just curly B lines superimposed upon each other. Okay? And if you notice the curly A, curly B, and curly C lines all occur due to the distension of lymphatics. So, when you see curly lines, whether it's A, B, or C, there is something wrong with the lymphatic drainage. Okay? For example, on this chest X-ray, you can see the peripheral perpendicular at the lower part of the lung. They are the curly what? A or B or C? 
write your question answers please good they are curly b while in the long base superimposed curly b lines one over the other is what curly what c exactly while you see these lines the white arrows extending from the periphery to the hilum periphery to the hilum these are curly what a excellent okay so we have here curly a b and c all in one chest x-ray so what are the causes of the curly lines basically anything that prevents proper lymphatic or blood drainage from the lung anything that causes lung to swell the interstitial tissue to accumulate fluid causes curly lines this is this includes uh, pulmonary edema pneumoconiosis infections for example viral or mycoplasma lymphangiectasia lymphatic is abnormal mitral valve disease that will prevent proper uh, drainage of the lung uh, blood into the left atrium lymphangitis carcinomatosis interstitial pulmonary fibrosis lymphatic obstruction of course congenital heart disease that can cause congested lungs sarcoidosis alveolar cell carcinoma lymphangiomyomatosis and pulmonary venous occlusive disease again venous because it will cause congested lungs now regarding the miliary pattern miliary pattern is relatively easy uh, millets are um, in arabic we call it dukhan okay these are the seeds for birds this is the millet okay and they are small rounded almost uniform size multiple innumerable okay so you can you will see small discrete opacities that are two to four millimeter in diameter on average three millimeter and mainly mainly it's seen in tuberculosis however keep in mind some malignancies are characterized by miliary metastasis like what what kind of malignancy metastasizes with miliary pattern no answer good thyroid carcinoma prevents uh, presents as miliary metastasis okay breast sometimes also can present as miliary however the typical malignancy to present with miliary metastasis is thyroid papillary carcinoma okay and as you can see in this chest x-ray there are multiple innumerable all over the lung both lungs from up to down from central to peripheral multiple innumerable tiny tiny nodules all over just like these millets here and there and there and there and there tiny nodules and you can see this something here was that this is an endotracheal tube okay for, for tracheostomy now let's talk a little bit about old pleural and pulmonary scars scars characterize that they are unchanged appearance on serial phones if you take the x-ray today and after three months and after six months and after one year they have the same shape or might even decrease in size but usually they are static don't change over uh, uh, serial films they appear as linear thin shadow with associated pleural thickening and tenting of the diaphragm because scars are fibrotic tissue that causes some cicatricial volume loss for example in this appearance you can see a linear band here and here these are due to scars as you can see in this magnified view uh, and they us usually because they are scars the adjacent pleura become reactive and get thicker so you see some thickening of the adjacent pleura the apical scarring is very common finding in healed tuberculosis old tb when there is old tb healed tb tuberculosis uh, it presents with apical scarring okay also we see them in sarcoidosis and fungal diseases 
Let's talk a little bit about bronchial cuffing or what we call thickened bronchial walls. Bronchial cuffing, basically it means that the bronchial walls are thick. They appear as they appear as a tram like parallel lines. Line here and line here and they appear as tram track like lines. Just two lines parallel to each other. Okay? If you see them in a parallel way. If you see them end on, you see the bronchial end on, they will appear as ring shadows. And they are common findings. We see this thickened bronchial walls or bronchial cuffing. It's common if uh, in bronchiectasis, recurrent asthma, bronchopulmonary aspergillosis, pulmonary edema, and lymphangitis carcinomatosis. Okay, so these lines makes the differential in this pattern. If you have other findings from other parts of the chest, the distribution of the abnormality, uh, look at the soft tissues, at the mediastinum, at the hyla, at the other things, you can narrow your differential diagnosis even less than that. Okay? What about solitary pulmonary nodule? If you have a patient, you did a chest x-ray for him, and you have a nodule sitting just there, one nodule solitary. First of all, what do we mean by pulmonary nodules? What's the definition of solitary pulmonary nodule? It's discrete, that means well-defined, well-marginated, rounded opacity. Less than or equal to 3 cm. If it is more than 3 cm, they are a, it's a mass, it's not a nodule. It should be completely surrounded by lung parenchyma. The surrounding tissues are all lung parenchyma, aerated lung. It does not touch the hilum, does not touch the mediastinum. Not associated with adenopathy, atelectasis, or a pleural effusion. Okay? If it is more than 4 cm, they are treated as malignancies until proven otherwise. Until there is a biopsy that says something else. But should be considered a malignancy and biopsy should be uh, done to confirm. For example, let's see here. These are examples of solitary pulmonary nodules. This is a nodule in the right lower lobe. Okay, It was later identified as hamartoma. What about this one? This is also a nodule in the right lower lobe confirmed to be primary pulmonary lymphoma. You can see it's a little bit peripheral, but probably on CT scan, maybe it was not touching the pleura. Okay. If you see a pulmonary, if you see a nodule, is it intrapulmonary or extrapulmonary? Now there is a sign that we can use it, and we talked about it in the previous uh, talk, in the previous lecture. If it is intrapulmonary, in contact with something, like for example with the pleura, it will form an acute angle with the lung at the edge of the lung, acute angle, like here. If this is the nodule and this is the pleura, for example, the angle here is acute if it is from within the lung. If it is from outside the lung, the angle will be wide, will be obtuse angle. Okay, so you can see here this is a nodule or a mass or whatever you like according to the size and what's the angle here it is wide or obtuse angle tamam so this is an extra uh, pulmonary mass not extra pleural sorry extra pulmonary uh, a nodule is assessed when you see a nodule you should assess the following the size the shape the outline is there any calcification or cavitation? Every one of these has different differential diagnosis. Okay. So, let's see. Solitary pulmonary nodules. If they are malignant or carcinomatous nodules, what do we expect to see? They will have a regular shape, 
speculated outline notched, notched margin it will not be perfectly circular there will be a notch here and there if you see a calcification that's good news because calcification more in favor of a benign lesion but not always some carcinomas might present with calcification or carcinoma may arise at the site of old calcification there is for example old TB healed by calcification and carcinoma arise there but most of the times calcification is more in favor of a benign lesion okay calcified metastasis can happen although rare most commonly from osteosarcoma or chondrosarcoma they present with calcific metastasis granulomas frequently calcify uh, that's why granulomas are very common they frequently calcify after a while and usually they are well defined they are lobulated so when you see calcification it's more in favor of a benign lesion like a, a granuloma but not always some metastasis can calcify like osteosarcoma and, and chondrosarcoma and sometimes carcinoma can arise from a pre-existing calcification for example this is a very well defined rounded lesion completely surrounded by lung tissue well aerated the rest of the chest looks good and you can see a tiny focus of calcification just here and this was a hamartoma okay while here patient was a known case of chondrosarcoma presented with this nodule in the lung and you can see very tiny uh, calcific fossa within it and it was a cal uh, yeah, uh, metastasis uh, with containing calcification from chondrosarcoma what about multiple pulmonary nodules so if we see single pulmonary nodule we know we know what to look for multiple pulmonary nodules for example here you can see any innumerable nodules big ones not miliary this is not miliary this is larger than miliary miliary is two to four millimeter these are maybe one 1.5 centimeter each if there are small nodules like two to four millimeter we call it miliary but this is not miliary if you see multiple nodules most commonly most commonly most commonly it is metastasis less likely to be tuberculous granulomas most of the times multiple one nodules are metastases less likely to be tuberculous granulomas calcified nodules are generally benign except from calcification or bone yani osteosarcoma or cartilaginous tumors like chondrosarcoma of course we should keep in mind the age of the patient if he's young like for example from 15 to 25 something in between this is more in favor of osteosarcoma if he's old like 60s 70s then it's more in favor of cartilaginous tumor or tuberculous granulomas that have been calcified so if they are large nodules big ones like more than three centimeter each and they are multiple then that's what we call cannonballs metastasis okay till now everything is okay everyone understand what i'm saying good now let's talk about pulmonary infarcts pulmonary infarcts are areas of the lung that for any reason uh, lost its blood supply leading to infarction just like cva cerebral infarct there is pulmonary infarct okay they are variable in appearance usually usually it present as a wedge shaped triangular shaped opacity with its base towards the periphery the base is towards the periphery and that's we call it hampton's hump just like here hampton's hump triangular based peripherally they tend to resolve slowly over months and they decreasing by as they resolve they decrease in size they call it melting sign if you follow it up it will decrease in size until most of the times only a band will remain 
only band they change from triangular to band like now let's talk about cavitating lesions and cysts what do you mean by cavitating lesion and cyst in the lung it means air cysts it's a gas filled space space that is filled with gas air surrounded by a complete wall which is three millimeter or greater in thickness okay cyst filled with air with a complete wall if the wall is less than three millimeter it's called cyst or ring shadows while if it is more than three millimeter it's a cavitating lesion so the wall thickness will determine if it is more than three millimeter it is cavitating lesion if it is less than three millimeter they are cysts or ring shadows since they contain air there must be a an airway that is communicating with the cavity with the necrotic area reaching giving air to them unless it is by a gas forming bacteria that's a different story most of the times it is due uh, the air is the gas present in the lesion due to a airway that is patent connected to the cavitated uh, cavitating uh, region most of uh, the common cavitating lesions what is the commonest differential diagnosis of a cavitating lesion are tuberculosis staphylococcal infection and carcinoma three differential diagnoses for example let's see here this is a lesion that contains gas inside you can see there is an air the black area is an air inside so is it a cyst or a cavitating lesion write me the answer please is this a cyst or a cavitating lesion exactly there is, this is a cavitating lesion why because the wall is thick it is more than a three centimeter uh, sorry three millimeter so thick wall means cavitating lesion okay and this was a bronchogenic carcinoma what is the more likely carcinoma lung carcinoma uh, to cavitate which one is more likely the most likely one to cavitate is squamous cell carcinoma squamous cell carcinoma come on adenocarcinoma also can cavitate metastasis can cavitate but the most common or more likely to cavitate of the lung uh, malignancies are uh, is the squamous lung carcinoma regarding here is this a cavitating lesion or a cyst again this is a cavitating lesion why because the wall is thick however if you notice the surrounding lung it's abnormal it's also involved and why is that because this is an abscess okay associated with a pneumonia in the adjacent part of the lung so these are consolidated parts of the lung and with a cavitating lesion that's thick cold and of course one of the commonest bacterial infections to cause cavitation is staphylococcal pneumonia okay here we need to know the clinical history we need to find out about the lab tests of the patient increased white blood cells uh, that can help us to narrow our differential from cavitating malignancy to cavitating abscess now each as we said previously each abnormality has a common site or يعني, a part of the lung that is more commonly being involved with this abnormality so the location of the region is a very important parameter in narrowing our differential diagnosis for example tuberculous cavities are more in the upper part of the lung that is the upper lung zone apical 
the, the long apics and the apical segment of the lower lobes. Even in the lower lobes, it goes into the apical segment. TB goes up. While the lung abscesses, if they are aspiration, following aspiration, someone who has aspirated uh, any, uh, anything, for example, vomiting and aspiration, will result in lung abscess. And, and since the aspiration, just like any foreign body, more likely to go to the right side and to the lower lungs. Yani if someone aspirated his vomiting, the vomitus will go into the right side, not the left, just like a foreign body, and it will go into the lower lung zones in an, an erect or sitting position. This is a position dependent. If the patient was in other position, it will go to other parts, okay? But in sitting position or erect position, most commonly it will go into the right side into the lower lung zone. So lesions there following history of aspiration are more likely to be abscesses due to aspiration pneumonia. What about trauma? Traumatic lung cyst, trauma can result in cyst formation. Since trauma occurs almost always from the periphery, so the lesions or the cyst will be subpleural in location. What about amoebic abscess? We have amoebic abscesses. They most commonly come from the liver. They erode through the diaphragm into the chest. And the liver is on the right side. So the amoebic abscesses are more commonly to be seen in the right lung base because they come from the liver through the diaphragm. Pulmonary infarcts more commonly in the lower lung lobes. Why? Because the emboli are, uh, yani they are some sort, uh, the, the embolus goes into, uh, according to gravity, they go inferiorly, not superiorly. Most of the times, not always. Now, let's have a little bit uh, of small compare uh, the causes, a little bit of differential diagnosis on the cavitating lesions based on the wall thickness. If they are thick walled or thin walled, thin walled are cysts, thick walled are cavitating lesions. So, what are the lesions that cause thick walled? cavitating lesions. First of all, acute abscesses, neoplasms in general, usually it's a squamous cell carcinoma, as we said. Lymphoma can cause cavitation if treated, not untreated lymphoma. Most metastases, Wigner's granulomas, and rheumatoid, rheumatoid lung nodules present also as cavitating lung lesions. While thin-walled cysts, let's say, including bully, Nematoceles, cystic bronchiectasis, hydatid cyst if ruptured can cause thin wall cysts. Ruptured, because uh, if unruptured, they represent as a cyst, uh, fluid filled cyst, just like a mass. Traumatic lung cyst contains air also. Chronic inactive tuberculous cavities, and rarely some neoplasms can be present as thin cysts. For example, let's see here. This here and here, you can see this is a huge air fault cyst with a very thin wall in some parts. This thick part is due to compressed lung. It's not due to the cyst. The lung is compressed. Okay? So, there is a thin line here. That is the wall of this huge air cyst. Again, here we have the same abnormality. This is compressed lung tissue. It's not thick. It's just compressed lung tissue. This is the wall. It's very thin. This is air cyst. Pneumato, pneumato, yani, seals. While here we have a thick walled cavity. This is a cavity, cavitating lesions. It has a thick wall and it has what? Air fluid level. And this is more in favor of either abscess or a tumor, a malignant tumor with cavitation and the bleeding. Now, let's talk a little bit about fluid levels. If we see a fluid level in the lung. First of all, you can't have a fluid level 
if you don't have air it's always always air fluid level if you if there is no air here there will be no fluid level here okay must have an air filled cavity to have a fluid level so fluid levels are common in primary tumors and irregular masses of blood or necrotic tumor can be present within the fluid level yani it's possible that you see a small mass here or here which is a clot or a necrotic tumor however you have an air fluid level okay they are uncommon in cavitating metastasis and tuberculous cavities it's mostly in tumors that are bleeding sometimes you see them in abscesses that are ruptured into adjacent airway so what are the causes of fluid levels on a chest radiograph if you see a chest x-ray with air fluid level what could be the cause of course according to the shape of the lesion that contains the air fluid level according to the location according to the number of the fluid levels according to the clinical history always always the history is very important so the causes will be either abscess hydronemothorax for example due to trauma or surgery or a bronchopleural fistula esophageal or pharyngeal pouches or diverticular obstruction tumors achalasia can cause air fluid level in the chest x-ray at the, the region of the esophagus i mean mediastinal air fluid levels can occur due to infections or esophageal perforation pericardium sometimes can show some air fluid levels surrounding the heart so the history is the most important thing just a small talk about what's called the air crescent sign it's a crescent shape lucency black crescent hilal dark in color within a parenchymal consolidation or nodular opacity there is an abnormal part of the lung here within it you see a dark crescent and what's that it is an air filling the space between the devitalized tissue this is the devitalized tissue that is necrotic necrotic tissue devitalized tissue forming a cavity and there is an air that uh, is filling the space between this tissue and the surrounding abnormal lung parenchyma this lung parenchyma is abnormal it is uh, opaque consolidated white okay uh, most commonly it's due to aspergilloma there is a cavity here with since it's a cavity within it aspergillus will grow forming what's called aspergilloma resulting in the air crescent sign again another sign it's a water lily sign it indicates a ruptured hydatid cyst with daughter cyst floating within the cavity this is a cyst that is fluid filled it was fluid filled so it was all of it was white for some reason it ruptured into the adjacent airway so the fluid within the cyst emptied into the airways cuffed or swallowed by the patient and the space now is filled with air however there are daughter cysts inside resulting in these lines what's called the water lily sign just like the uh, flower the lily floating on the uh, water so when you see water lily sign this indicates a ruptured hydatid cyst other intracavitary lesions, something that we can see inside a cavitating lesion, include inspissated pus, blood clot, sometimes there is something called cavernolith, that is calcification of a vein inside the cavitary lesion, blood clot may form within a cavitating neoplasm, neoplasm that cavitates, bleeds inside, forming blood clot, and sometimes can be seen in tuberculosis and pulmonary infarcts, blood clots can be seen there. Uh, I think we can maybe stop here now and we continue in the next session we'll talk a little bit about calcifications and other things uh, thank you very much for listening and we'll see you after two days